Welcome to the Monday edition of Dividend Cafe. We are right in the middle of September, and I want to give you the normal update uh, as to all the things going on in the market with public policy, with the Fed, with housing, with the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, look, in the written version of this today, DividendCafe.com, Monday edition, I ended up going into a very long screed about the U.S. steel uh, the Japanese company Nippon Steel, their proposed acquisition. Uh, it's a big public policy moment because the Biden administration has said that they want to block the deal. They've now said in the last couple of days that they may delay blocking the deal, which would effectively probably just punt it until after the election. And then we have two presidential candidates that have both said they want to block the deal current Vice President Harris, former President Trump, both saying they're um, wanting to block the deal. Other than that, I don't know a whole lot of people, myself included, who are against the deal. And so what I did at the Written Dividend Cafe is I ended up writing a big explanation as to why um, I'm supportive of the deal and what I think is sort of the the market-based, you know, free society argument in favor of this particular deal. Uh, it's an economic argument and, and gets into the reality of the, the capital needs of the company. It's not a political um, position. But anyways, I'm not going to go through all that here on the video or the podcast now. I just want to let you know that that's there at the Monday edition of today's DividendCafe.com if you're interested. As far as the market goes today, the Dow closed at uh, yet another all-time high. It was up 228 points. At one point earlier this morning, it had been up about 300 points, stayed up throughout the day. Um, and that's in a day when technology was down quite a bit. Tech was the worst performing sector, down 1%. Uh, the NASDAQ closed down about 50 basis points itself. The S&P was barely up. And then the Dow was up over half a percent, 228 points. So you had a big day from both financials and energy, uh, which were up 1.2% each. So just one of those days, I call it a 2022 day, where certain things in those types of sectors did quite well and, and uh, the tech side did not. Um, Interesting, as we get ready for the Fed meetings of Tuesday and Wednesday this week, it's now been 146 days since the Fed last hiked rates. Um, and so that kind of time period between a rate hike and then the next rate cut, this will be the second longest time period on record, but by far the highest return for markets of any period between a hike and then a cut. Um, this has been the best performance in markets between those two. You know, we're looking at um, a pretty a pretty good period of time, and I think that it will end up being uh, something that we'll have to write about more as to why that is. In terms of the ten-year bond closed uh, today, three point six two percent. That was down three basis points. Just think about that. The, the two-year yield is down to three and a half. The 10-year, 3.6, uh, down you know, meaningfully from where they were just a couple months ago. Uh, obviously, this means that returns for bond investors have been positive. It's pushed bond prices higher as yields drop, obviously. Uh, but it really does beg the question, aside from Fed expectations, what are the growth and inflation expectations causing this downward pressure on bond yields? I think you know my answer. Um, foreign ownership of U.S. Treasury debt. Uh, that is a discussion that gets a lot of play, what it means, what it doesn't mean um, in the context of interest rate prospects, what it means for currency. Uh, I think, though, one has to wonder if there is a decline in foreign investor appetite for U.S. Treasury debt, which I don't see a lot of, why people think that speaks to a decline in U.S. dollar appetite when foreign appetite for U.S. corporate bonds, which are denominated in the U.S. dollar, uh, is so robust. It would seem to me that there's pretty high confidence from foreign investors in, at least on a relative basis, which is all that matters here, in American economic prospects 
um, when you consider the high uh, foreign purchase of U.S. corporate bonds. Uh, my final market comment, U.S. projected earnings right now for 2025, for next year, have gotten up to $280 in the S&P. I remain quite skeptical that will be hit, but very open to the idea that it will. Now, my uh, kind of a little water on the, the party comment, if it does happen, you're still right now forward multiple at 20.1 times earnings at the $280 earnings level of next year. Um, and then as far as the possibility of it not happening, it would mean yet further still margin expansion off of what has already been a rather robust expansion of corporate earnings margins. That could happen. That earnings number could happen as well. I am skeptical. I think that there's downside risk to that projection. But even apart from that, even if it were to happen, you're still talking about an over 20 times multiple in the S&P. In terms of the news this weekend, we're aware of the um, second assassination attempt on President Trump's Secret Service, this time uh, being able to get involved uh, early on and the suspect was caught and apprehended. That certainly dominated the news cycle on Sunday. Um, I've already mentioned the change potentially in the Biden administration's uh, approach to the U.S. Steel um, acquisition uh, by the Japanese company uh, Nippon Steel. However, um, I'm not going to go through my 10 points it, that are at DividendCafe.com laying out uh, considerations as to why the deal makes sense for the U.S. considerations. The New York Manufacturing Index came out this morning. This was a big surprise. Now, these indexes are very volatile and are subject to a lot of reversals, so I don't put a lot of weight into it until we get kind of three months in a row, and I say that about a lot of data points. But we were expecting a contraction of about 4.0. It had been down 4.7 last month. It ended up expanding 11.5. So a huge beat, largely driven by new orders. Um, again, it's one month. We'll wait and look at it again next month. Uh, the most interesting economic factoid I read, you know, I always am reading a bunch of this stuff over the weekend, and one, and I try to incorporate some of it in the Monday Dividend Cafe where appropriate. Um, there, were, there are right now 90 million people in the United States who have an active 401k plan or defined contribution plan. Uh, and there were 30 million in uh, 1984, 40 years ago. There were 30 million in 1984 that were participants in a defined benefit plan, a pension. There are 10 million now. So the pension plan participants went from 30 million to 10 million. The 401k went from 30 million to 90 million. Just thought it was interesting. Another interesting stat to share with you, very important as we think about the overall office picture. 39.8%, if you don't mind, we'll just call it 40%. 39.8% of owner-occupied homes have no mortgage. It's the highest in history. It was at 32% just over 10 years ago. So a significant increase in 100% equity homes with no debt and no carry costs, again, adding to the um, reason that higher interest rates have not been as big of a factor in the housing market because a higher interest rate doesn't affect someone who isn't paying any interest at all. Switching gears to the office market, which is something I do like talking about in Dividend Cafe on Mondays from time to time or other elements of commercial real estate. Uh, I was struck, I need to unpack it more if you're interested in more granularity, but I read a kind of high level report about how robust the office market is in Singapore. And it got me thinking, you know, if one believes that the problem with the asset class in, in commercial real estate of office is that the entire concept is obsolete and no one is going to work in an office anymore. And, and you know, there's other factors that make it uh, even worse for some components and a little better for others, but broad based, the office market is in a state of secular decline. It really does make you wonder why it would not be the case in all cities, let alone a very cosmopolitan and robust economic growth city like Singapore. Well, my view is that office is not obsolete and that Singapore happens to benefit from being a largely class A office space and not having 
the huge glut of antiquated class B and class C space that some American big cities have and not dealing with uh, cities that have been totally turned upside down by various factors in the last several years. Um, but then even that broader based point about whether or not people are going back to work, I, I wanted to, I put in a picture from BBC of Amazon announcing an end of hybrid requiring all office staff to be back going into next year, five days a week and ending of their hybrid policy. So do with that what you will. Yes, the Fed meets on Wednesday. Uh, it looks like, again, I'm going to be wrong. Futures market is now really pivoted to being advantage half point cut this week, not quarter point. Uh, as of this morning, the futures and the Fed funds rate were pricing in a 59% implied probability of a half point cut this week. Um, and so obviously a 41% implied probability of a quarter point cut. Uh, that 59 is not conclusive, obviously, but it's interesting that the momentum has moved that way. We'll see what they do. Uh, the PAL announcement, the FOMC announcement followed by the PAL press conference will take place on Wednesday of this week. Midstream up another 1.2% last week. Oil closed today at $70.50, up about half a percent. The against doomsdayism section is back. I've been a little remiss in, in uh, finding weekly content for that, but uh, it's not for lack of material, I'll tell you that. World Bank just updated their report a few days ago. 690 million people in our world living in abject poverty. That's 690 million too many, obviously. But that number was 1.1 billion in 2010, so just over a decade ago. And it was, it's, uh, so it's down 400 million less people in abject poverty in 14 years. And it's down over a billion since the turn of the century. In 24 years, there are a billion less people living in abject poverty um, in terms of the World Bank data. I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, then a question about how we think around dividend growth investing uh, for someone who loves the concept, believes in it, but is themselves engaged in venture capital. And do I see that as contradictory? And I want to be very, very clear. Nowhere in our worldview of dividend growth is it set against other things that are vital in capital markets, such as private market investing, including venture capital. Now, it invites a totally different objective, a totally different risk profile, a totally different liquidity profile. Um, there are, you know, we believe dividend growth investing is extremely appropriate at different weightings in an asset allocation for almost all investors, not all, but a very, very high portion. Venture capital might be something that's appropriate for a very, very small amount of investors. But the fact that it has a different risk reward characteristic and a different objective, it doesn't make it illegitimate at all. It makes it different in the way it is used by an investor. The um, role of venture capital in our overall financial markets is vital. We are big supporters. We utilize alternatives, private markets, venture capital throughout our investing process. It's just that it isn't the core kind of anchor position of a portfolio from an income, liquidity, risk reward trade off standpoint that dividend growth is. So it's just asking us to compare apples and oranges in this case. All right, I'm going to leave it there. What a wonderful Monday it's been here in beautiful New York City. Fall is upon us. Uh, reach out with any questions. Have a great Monday night. We'll be with you throughout the week. Look forward to uh, your main Dividend Cafe on Friday as well. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.